Welcome to this meeting of the Board of Selectmen for January 29th, 2019. Um, before this meeting, the Board met in executive session to consider litigation strategy with respect to a petition of Eversource Energy for zoning exemption, to consider litigation strategy with respect to DJ, TJA Clean Energy LLC versus Hopkinton Planning Board, and to consider the purchase, sale, lease, or value of real property in relation to Open Space Preservation Center Trail Town Hall and the Main Street Corridor Project, uh, because the Chair declares that discussion in open session will be detrimenting to the litigating or negotiating position of the board. So now um, we will convene in public session and open the meeting with the Pledge of Allegiance, please. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And uh, as usual, we will start with our public forum. Uh, if any member of the public uh, would be interested uh, in sharing their ideas, opinions, and questions regarding town government, please step up to the microphone. Mr. Terry? Good evening. It's Terry time. It's Terry time. <laughs> My name is Thomas Terry, 17 Maple Street. Just wanted to drop off some literature that supported it. The last meeting you were kind enough to let me speak a little bit about the center school. And there's some research that needs to be done. It's nothing should be handled in a session tonight. So I wanted to leave these papers with you. Okay, right. great. Thank you. And for the board and everyone to peruse. Oh, so this one, it's one packet. It's one packet, right? Okay, thank you, Mr. Terry. All right. Very good. Is there anyone else? Hearing none? Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, next on our agenda is the staff recognition, and the Board of Selectmen will recognize Denise Coffrin, who is retiring at the end of January, after 12 years of service at the Hopkinton Public Library. I believe Denise was the children's, our beloved children's librarian. Come on up, Denise. We're happy for you and sad at the same time. Heather? Yes, well, I sort of feel the same way. <laughs> <laughs> Would you like us to sit? Sure, if you want to. So I know you've certainly seen a lot of changes from the time being up in the little little garret of the old yes. building. My own little cocoon up there, yes. My own little cocoon. And uh, I know my daughters uh, loved the children's room. It, it just, uh, we would, I had a limit on the pile of books they could they could bring home with so that I a certain number that I could keep track of all the time so we didn't lose them but um, I can just only imagine now with your expanded room all the all the resources you have um, and uh, I think that was probably before you were there but the librarians were always so supportive and so caring for the children and and um, you know just we're so useful in finding just the right thing for, for each child. And uh, I know we'll certainly miss you because what the children's room does, I think, plays a really key role in those formative years of establishing a love for learning and a love for reading and, and just a love for the library. Yes, it does. I agree completely. <laughs> I'm sure you've had some funny stories and some wonderful, wonderful memories that go with that. Yes. Um, trying to think of, you know, put on the spot to think of one. Um, it's not a funny story, but one of, um, I think, the most heartwarming things is I had a young man a number of years ago, and I was trying to get him to sign up for summer reading, and he said, no, no, I don't know, and his mother said, well, he has, he has trouble, you know, um, I don't know if it's dyslexia or what it was, and I said, well, have you ever listened to a book, an audio book? And he said, no, that wouldn't count. I said, oh, yes, it counts for me. And he did, and he went through almost our entire selection of audiobooks. Mm -hmm. And um, when we did the um, Hopkinton Reading Marathon a few years ago, he, he participated, he did it, and he was so proud when he went up to receive his um, citation for that. So 
that was one of the best stories I have. That is wonderful. And uh, I'm thinking you might have been the, the librarian that helped me the day I came up to get a picture of the Emily Poulsen mm -hmm. poem yes. that's framed there. Yes. Um, but Hopkinton had Emily Poulsen live here for about 10 years and she really her her heart was in children's education and she founded the children's room and gave over 200 copies to start a children's library because back in the day late 1800s they didn't I don't think they really recognized the importance of introducing reading to the, to the children and now you know you're you're proof of how important that is and I had been here a couple of months so this is about 12 years ago and I received an email from somebody in Alaska who was doing research on Emily Poulsen, and she wrote to say, um, I understand that this quote is hanging in the Hopkinton Public Library. Is that true? And I wrote back, I said, yes, it is. <laughs> Sent the quote back, and but she found that in some reference book in Alaska. And not to get off the topic of you, but for those of you who are watching wondering what we're talking about, um, there's, a, there's a nice uh, historical marker sign now that's, a, that's installed on the playground behind Marathon School that tells the whole story of Emily Poulsen and her love for the library. She was a teacher of, of the blind and handicapped children. And uh, Hopkinton was where she really made her mark in, in the children's library. So I am hogging you, but I want to open it up to other members of the board who might have a few have a few words to say and then we have a very nice certificate to express our appreciation. Other members? Mr. Herr? So if I could just do a little bit of business here while we thank you and celebrate your retirement. Um, when, when we leave a job, many of us, uh, we feel a little lighter and we feel like if there's a couple things on our mind that we want to share, that's the time to do it. So without putting you on the spot, because we've got a great building over there, I think a great culture, which is more important. Um, for the kids and for the town to learn and relax and enjoy the library. Is there anything that you see that we should know that we could improve upon? Well, I, I won't say to improve upon it, but we have a fantastic staff at the library. Um, everybody has been very supportive of each other. And I just recently read a quote on um, line from a gentleman who said, the most important asset of the library goes home every night when the doors close mm -hmm. and I think that's true and um, I just would ask that um, you continue to support the staff of the Pop Hopkinton library um, because they're the they're the people who are you know meeting your children meeting your adults helping the seniors um, it's and I have enjoyed every minute that I have worked here and so nothing jumps out at you that we may not be aware of that you see working day in and day out that that we should try to address um keep the budget going could use more budget for um i believe we get to that materials an <laughs> and um it's well timed heather <laughs> yes so i mean hopkinton has always been supportive of the library since i've been here and i would just encourage you to encourage to in, uh, continue that Great. Well, I appreciate you answering those questions, and I just wanted to take it, the opportunity to make sure we're all on the same page. I love the library, and I think it's a great asset for the community. And you're right, the people are the, the drivers, key drivers behind it. Uh, and we're, we're going to miss you. I assume we're going to replace the children's librarian uh, in some form or fashion. And uh, my kids went through there, some of them not enough uh, over the years. Others enjoyed it more. but. Um, I, I think it's a wonderful asset, and we're going to miss you, and we appreciate your service to the town. Thank you very much. Mr. Mr. Ted Stone. So, yeah, building off what Brian said, uh, thank you for 12 years of your life giving it to the town, and uh, I can't think of anything that would be more rewarding to do than just come here and, and work with the kids in the town and teach them how to read and work with them and, and develop their interest in the library and, and watch them develop and flourish as from children up through graduating high school and, and beyond. So I'm sure it was a very rewarding job, um, but as a, uh, as a selectman, I would like to say thank you very much for giving 12 years of your life to the town uh, to better the youth of our town. Thank you. Um, I guess the, the best days that I have are when somebody comes back and said, you know that book, I loved it. What else do you have? And it's like, oh. Yeah. 
But just that story about her convincing that young man to listen to those books on tape, that's really cool, you know? That's yeah. awesome. I thought he didn't like Imagine books. how you touched that life, you know, or that, that, and how long that will last. Well, and his mother came at the end of that summer and said to me, he asks to come to the library now. She said, awesome. I never thought that would happen. That's awesome. That's, that's great. And I'm sure there's hundreds of kids like that for your experience. Well, I know how important the um, children's section of the library is. <clears throat> it's the most I was, important. I was, I, was, I was raised there. My, all three of my sisters worked at the library after school and for my brother and I that was our after school program because both my parents worked and, and until they came home we were we were there reading every single day and so it's, at, at, at one point we didn't like it very much but then looking back at it it was it was very enriching it was you know I, I as I brought my kids here to the to the children's library when they were younger um, it just brought back all those memories of, of how important it was to, to help, help us read and, 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 and um, how much it, how enriching it was for us. So thank you so much for giving us 12 years and, and, and really touching so many kids. It's been my pleasure. There's not a lot much more I can add to everything that's been said, but I do want to say thank you so much. Uh, 12 years is a, is a long time to really devote to our kids. I know that my kids really benefited from it. And I will say that um, in this technology age, the fact that you keep the, the, you know, help the kids stay interested in coming into the library and helping them look at books and read, um, whether it be through whatever medium, whether it be through a, a book on tape, you know, e-books or what have you, I think that keeping that interest alive is, is so critical. And, uh, and I think that you've really helped us get there uh, with, you know, Kids sometimes will say, oh, well, why don't you just look it up on Google? Like, well, <laughs> there's a lot of benefits actually sitting down with someone and helping them find you, find what you're looking for. It certainly is. Thank you. Well, thank you, Denise, and uh, a small token of our appreciation. We do have um, a citation to say thank you from the Board of Selectmen. And if you'd like, maybe should we get a quick picture with Denise? Can we do that in front of the town? Town Quilt, you've uh, made a big contribution to us, and we're sorry to see you go. Thank you again, Denise. Um, next is our consent agenda, and we have three items which we may take individually if board members so choose. First, our board minutes. The Board of Selectmen will consider approving the January 15th Board of Selectmen minutes. Second, our library ambulance fund gifts. The Board of Selectmen will consider accepting the following gifts. A gift of $100 from Ray Michelle Holmgren as a gift to the Hopkinton Library general gift fund b ambulance fund gifts totaling 150 dollars in memory of marge wright and c ambulance fund gifts totaling 165 dollars in memory of roy robeson and thirdly the faith community church global 6k for water parade permit um, the board of selectmen will consider approving a parade permit for Joshua Morrison on behalf of the Faith Community Church for its annual Global 6K for Water to be held on May 4th, 2019 at 9 a.m., beginning and ending at Faith Community Church, East Main Street. Expected number of participants is 750. Um, would anyone like to take any of these individually? 
Yeah, I will uh, carve out uh, two. Item two for Mr. Ted Stone. Pull item three. And Mr. Nazrula would like item three. Okay, so that need, means the uh, I'll make a motion minutes. to approve the minutes of 1 uh, 15 19. So moved. Second. Is there a second? Okay, second. moved and seconded. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 And opposed, that's unanimous. Um, and so carried. Uh, library and ambulance fund gifts. Mr. Ted Stone. Yeah, so these keep coming in, and it's, uh, it's nice that I get a, a second to talk about this, it seems, every meeting. Um, so the $150 that was given in memory of Marge Wright. Marge Wright was a, a pretty uh, uh, fun person in town. She was my bus driver when I was uh, kindergarten. She never let me forget it. Uh, she was a, a, a real fun person um, through her entire life. And her husband worked in town for a long time, her son and daughters, and they're all in town still. And, and it's, uh, it's nice to see, uh, you know, unfortunately with Marge's passing, to pull some good out of it, it's nice to see some uh, some money that that comes in as gifts going to a, a great fund. And the same thing with Roy Robson. Um, I'm not going to go over the whole thing with Roy Robson as I do every every meeting it seems. But another long timer in town that's done uh, that that will be missed. And uh, when these we'll call them old timers, long timers in Hopkinton pass away, <coughs> um, there are people that in my life in Hopkinton. They've had a lot of impact, and, and uh, I've, I've had a lot of dealings with them. Uh, it's hard to replace them and the history of the town. So uh, thank you very much for the people that donated for Marge Wright and to Roy Robson, as well as the um, Ray Michelle Holmgren for the, uh, the Library General Gift Fund. Um, and I would add, in addition to mentioning the contributions of these people who have passed and how by these contributions they continue to support the town. I always like to just mention by name the generous citizens who have made contributions. Um, in the case of Marge Wright, contributions are from Jennifer McMillan and Don Manchester. We thank you. And the ambulance fund gifts for Roy Robson are again Jennifer McMillan, Don Manchester, and B. McMullen. Thank you very much. So is there a motion now to approve um, and accept these library fund gifts? Um, $100 from Ray Michelle Holmgren, 150 in memory of Marge Wright, and 165 in memory of Roy Robeson to the, um, those two are ambul ambulance fund. The previous is the library general gift. So moved. Second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Those that is unanimous. Uh, Faith Community Church, Mr. Nasrilla. Yeah, I just wanted to take a moment just to say um, how, <laughs> how wonderful this is. Um, access to clean water is critical uh, for <laughs> to sustain human life. And I, I know a good friend of mine uh, was working with under working in underdeveloped countries, and um, as well as working in, in my native land of Pakistan to get access to clean water. And where people were getting, um, drinking water out of a river and getting sick, he was able to use a well, a well pump, and a solar panel. And that was able to increase the mortality rate 20 fold in those, in those villages. So I just find this, um, I think that the a, a global you know, 6K for, for water for children in underdeveloped, underdeveloped uh, countries is a wonderful endeavor. And um, I think this is uh, this is fabulous, and it's something I hold close to my heart because I have seen the results personally. So I just wanted to say thank you. And not only is that, I mean, I think a lot of people are coming to recognize the importance of that because um, looking back over the permitting team comments that we received for this this race, I remember it from last year. It's always well run. It's always trouble free, but every year it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And in fact, this year the police and fire said. You know, they're at the max before they need to take it to the next level for various, you know, police and fire services because every year the number of participants just grows. And, and that really uh, speaks to not only the importance, but the generosity of the people in this community that are that are stepping up for this cause. So um, I'm glad you took the time um, or fun to speak about this. Uh, I will ask for a motion to approve the parade permit for the um, global 
let me see, get, get the name right here. Faith Community Church's Global 6K for Water. So moved. Second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 And opposed, that is unanimous. Thank you. Right on schedule, uh, board and committee appointments action. We have two. Um, one is to the Cultural Council and one is uh, to the Veteran Celebration Committee. First, the Board of Selectmen will consider appointing Amy Groves and Ilana Cassidy to the Cultural Council. These are, there are currently four vacancies with terms expiring June 30th, 2020. Um, are Amy or Ilana here? Step right up. You are? Yes, that's me. Um, my name's Amy Groves, and I'm at 2 College Street. Hello. Thank you, Amy. So tell us a little about you. I, I look through. You have a wonderful background in arts and glass work, and you've got a great professional background, but you sound like you're a wonderful, wonderful craftsman in the arts um, in your own right. And uh, so tell us a little about yourself and why it seems kind of obvious to me why you want to be on this, but, but tell us a little about yourself. Yeah, I have a checkered past, so <laughs> uh <-oh>. <laughs> <laughs> tried everything. <laughs> but yeah, I do have, um, and you'll see an attachment to your um, packet tonight, but um, I do have a lot of um, uh, background with um, violin and piano, and with, you know, I have a fused art glass hobby. I have a kiln in my basement, and I have not blown up my house yet. Um, oh, I've exhibited... Fire chief's right behind you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for that one. <laughs> Make sure it's permitted. <laughs> <laughs> it is, it is. Um, and I've exhibited at, at Poly Arts in, in Ashland and um, have a background with French literature, so creative writing and um, what else, dance, ballet, um, modern dance, although you wouldn't know it anymore, but I, I have done that. Um, so I, can, I kind of have a, a sense of a little bit of um, a lot of the different arts involved. Um, I've kind of taken a look at what the group does. Um, part of it is awareness of the arts and ability to evaluate different applications, and part of it is just being able to handle a spreadsheet, I think. Um, the budget does not appear to be huge, but it's nice work if you can get it because you don't have to make the money, you just have to hand it out. So I think it would be a wonderful job, so I'd love to apply for it. Well, it certainly seems like you have a, a broad spectrum of, of talents and interests that can, that can uh, be brought to this. Um, do other board members have any questions or comments for Amy? I'm, I'm delighted to see you come forward. Through the chair? I would like to just... Just to add, uh, I can't think of a more qualified person. I had the pleasure of working with Amy in the last election, and uh, I'm not doing anything. everything that you've attempted, I've seen you succeed <laughs> with flying colors, and uh, I think it would be, it's my honor to endorse you for this position. I think you'd be fabulous, and uh, you've already been a wonderful addition to the town, and the more involvement we can get out of you, the better. <laughs> would you like to make a motion? Um, I'll make a motion to... Uh, for the board to appoint uh, Amy Groves to the Cultural Council. Second. Okay, that motion has been made and seconded, and that will be for a term expiring June 30th, 2020. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 And opposed? That is unanimous. Thank you, Thank Amy. you Amy. Thank you very much. And Thanks, uh, Ilana, I guess, is not here. Uh, I noticed she has some nice experience in, in the arts as well. Um, and. We're very happy to have some of these spots filled. So um, does someone wish to make a motion to appoint Alana Cassidy? I'll make a motion to appoint Alana Cassidy to the Cultural, the Cultural Council. Council. Second. All right. Moved and seconded. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 And opposed, that is unanimous. Thank you, Ilana, if you're watching at home. Uh, second, the Board of Selectmen will consider appointing Becky Canty to the Veteran Celebration Committee. There are currently two vacancies, and there's something wrong here because it says with terms expiring June 30th, 2018 and June 30th, 2021. Is that, we don't know if that's 2019? It's not 18. It's 2021. Are they both 2021? Correct. Oh. This says terms expiring of June 18 and June 2021, but they're so both 2021. Yeah. It should have just been said, it should have just been 2021. Yeah. Okay, so they're both the same, same length of terms. Okay, all right. Uh, Becky here tonight? She's not. Mike's here. Mike's here. Mike? Come on up, Mike. Come on up, Mike. I know Becky just, uh, Kind of lost in the family, and uh, 
Michael Whalen, 262 Wood Street. I'm the uh, chairman of the Veterans Celebration Committee. Uh, Rebecca had a conflict, so she couldn't come tonight, and I just told her I would come here and uh, just say a little something on her behalf. She's been uh, volunteering for veterans' events for some time now, and uh, I encouraged her to apply for this open position, and she she obviously did, and I just came here tonight to encourage you to make this appointment. Excellent. I think a lot of us know Becky, and she. there's no question about her involvement and commitment to veterans' activities, and she cooks a mean meter veterans' dinner down at the That's right. Gun. Well, I think she has help from her dad. <laughs> He's done it once or twice. <laughs> yes, he has. He has. It's the best <laughs> yeah. dinner going. So, uh, so delightful. Just to, to add on what Mike says, um, I've known Becky my whole life. We graduated high school together. Um, Becky, you has been so unbelievable with the veterans and if anybody knows Becky uh, she's been through the ringer these last few years and um, I I've never seen anybody with that go, goes through so much adversity just come through it with such a smile and a positive out, outlook um, the fir my first year as selectman I spoke at the veterans dinner and I was the only one there without a red white and blue tie the next afternoon in my mailbox there was a red white and blue tie with a note saying you look like an unmade bed last night uh, love you Becky. so um i wear a tie i uh i can't i i can't um um push for becky to be on more committees she's she's just she's absolutely the best and we're lucky to have her on any committee we can but the fact that she's she's looking to get on the veterans committee uh, you know, she has a lineage with her dad. Her dad was a, you know, was a Vietnam vet and, and just uh, another great guy. So it's, it's, I just can't say enough great things about Becky. She's one of the best people I've ever come across in my life. And um, we're lucky to have her uh, apply for this. Would you like to make a motion? I would love to make a motion to put Becky Canty uh, on the Veterans Celebration Committee. Term expiring uh, June 30th, 2021. I'll Second. sort that out with Maria. Whatever that expired date is. No, I don't think it needs it's to be. Mr. Mr. Kamala explained. They, they both terms okay. are supposed to be 2021. That was a. And Mike, thank call. you for everything you do for the Veteran Celebration. No kidding. Wow. That's it. It's the extent of my niceness tonight. I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that motion has been made and seconded. All those in favor of appointing Becky Candy to the Veteran Celebration Committee for a term expiring June 30th, 2021, please say aye. 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 Pose that is unanimous. Tell Becky thank you very much for serving. I will. Thank you. Thank you for Thanks coming. Thanks, Mike. Yeah, great. Okay. Uh, so and uh, now, Youth Commission charge. This is also a 7 o'clock agenda item. This is a 7 o'clock. We're supposed to move quickly here. Uh, the Board of Selectmen will consider <laughs> updating the Youth Commission charge, including membership. And I think we had a charge that was sent to us and Mr. Kamalo, is is what was sent to us the update with what you and I discussed, or do you have something to report? I know you had. Uh, there's been some change we in how we might use. Yes, in. I know Don is here. Yeah, through Don. the. Does Don want to? Through come the up? chair. Yes. yes, through the chair. I was going to extend an invitation to Don. the chair and the vice chair of the youth commission. On up, Don. Uh, included in the board's packet is an updated charge uh, for the Hopkinton Youth Commission. Uh, the revisions that I included in the updated charge uh, for the most part reflect uh, a conversation that I had with the chair and the vice chair of the Youth Commission. Let me walk you through the changes that are proposed. Uh, first and foremost, I think with much thanks to Elaine as well as John Cotino, we have included a statement that references the town's uh, mission statement uh, and the specific theme that applies to the work of the commission. In, in terms of the specific request from the board to address membership, uh, suffice to say that in my discussions with the representatives from the commission, we evaluated two options. 
uh, one option was to simply expand the committee from seven to nine members. Uh, we looked at what that might mean in terms of the committee's ability uh, to conduct its business, uh, to meet its mission, uh, and at the end of that conversation, we felt that perhaps a different alternative uh, could be accomplished. Namely, uh, the statement that I have included in the charge is italized and it reads as follows. In addition, the Commission may, from time to time, designate any number of auxiliary members who have accepted leadership roles in connection with one or more of the Commission's programs or projects or goals. Auxiliary members are invited to participate actively in Commission deliberations and are encouraged to seek appointment as voting or associate members when, op when opportunities arise. What this does is basically accomplish two things. Number one, from my discussions with the representatives of the Commission, it was pretty clear that the Commission is involved in uh, the feel-good programs in town that require heavy lifting and a lot of support from community members. So therefore, simply looking at adding two members would not get them to that point. And thus, the recommendation is that the Commission be given the okay to conscript auxiliary members at any level, to any number, at any scale that they deem necessary. And then secondly, um, there was also the, the, the focus on building a deeper bench, i.e. people that could be trained to um, and encouraged to apply for any vacancies that come up. So this is the option that we're recommending to the board, uh, and uh, perhaps at this point you may turn to the, to the representatives from the commission to see if they feel the same way. John? Yeah. I think, okay. yeah. You worked with Mr. 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 Kamal on this, I assume. We did. We had a meeting with him and <laughs> drafted this together. So you're in support yes. of this concept? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, can, I, can I just ask, looking at before this paragraph, the, the previous composition, you've got the seven voting members, and then it talks about non-voting members, police officer, two student representatives, so that's three, and then there are liaisons from uh, youth services, school committee, parks and rec, and board of selectmen, that would be four, that's an additional seven. Um, do those seven or three or four, do they characteristically come to your meetings or are they just a liaison if you need so, so you're usually working with 14 people they they usually do come um, sometimes there's a conflict with the parks and recs um, Amy Markovich is our liaison so with her meetings but if not she's there um, so yeah our liaisons are at our meetings in fact our youth liaisons are generally always at our meetings um, one of the suggestions we had brought to Norman was we wanted to open up the ability to bring in more youth liaisons. Um, and so instead of having to pick a number, this kind of gives us the opportunity to do that. Um, if we have a topic that we have youth that are, you know, passionate about a suicide prevention and we have 10 of them, we don't have to say, well, wait, we only have two or four listed. Okay. Um, or whatever the topic might be. Yeah. So, yes, we generally have all of our liaisons present for our meetings. But obviously, these, these are non-voting and the auxiliaries are non-voting, so it's not like you could have quite, num quite a number of people, but it's not going to be cumbersome to getting your job done. Right. And that was some of our concern with <coughs> at just adding on additional members. Right. Right. And, and sometimes if a board gets too big, <coughs> I've actually seen boards that got too big and had trouble getting a quorum. That's because nobody thinks somebody else we've is been there. Be there, and all of a sudden nobody's there. So. This is our exact problem. <laughs> that we've we've been there. Yeah. I've been there. We've been there. Yeah. yeah. So. Yes. yes, we've we've experienced that a lot last year, and so that's also why we were like we're in a good place right now. Let's be able to get our boots on the ground and continue to move forward. And when it comes to vote time, there's only seven. So those seven people still know that no matter how many other ones are out there, we need you seven because you can't do business without the seven. So that's, that's your... Yeah. And if... Um, I'm Natalie Langlois, by the way. <laughs> um, 
we also really like the auxiliary membership idea because we often have community volunteers that are really passionate about one particular subject or another and we don't want them to feel like you know if one topic or another isn't their thing or they have a busy family life or work life they don't have to always right. be there but we welcome participation we love when people come and we've had a lot of interest um, from yeah. the community and in, in various things that we do so it would be great to have that flexibility you can mix it up when you need yeah. to. Sounds great. Yeah. Mr. Gattino, you worked with them on this? Are you happy? Yeah, oh, I think it's great. Uh, yeah, I, I spoke with them at the uh, at the Martin Luther King uh, Give Back Day, especially. Mm -hmm. um, and um, uh, you know, it's you know that was just a day of service. But there's you know there's so many people in this town that uh, that give years of service. And I appreciate it, and thanks for the input because we did have to expand it. Yeah. And uh, this, this, this really seems like a controllable expansion. Yeah. Other members, other board members have questions. Mr. Hearn. So I've heard a couple of different numbers. I may be confused. Are we going from seven to nine voting members? No. We're staying with seven voting members and then auxiliary members as they see fit, not as we see fit, correct? Correct. All set. Thank you. Okay. That sounds like, especially if you're happy with it. You're the ones that count. So, with that, uh, uh, I'd like to make a motion to, um, to <coughs> amend, the, uh, amend the charge of the youth, commit, uh, youth commission as drafted by the um, by the town manager and town council. Second. All right, moved and seconded. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? That is unanimous. Good. Thank you. Take thank it away. You. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much. Thanks so much. Okay. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, common vidler license for Aramark and Dell. The Board of Selectmen will consider approving a new common vidler license applications from Samantha Smiley on behalf of Aramark at Dell for four locations, 42 South Street, 171 South Street, 176 South Street, and 228 South Street. Um, oh, Hi. you must be Samantha. I am. Things seem to be in order. Um, do board members have questions? I don't. Our mark is uh, pretty well known in the industry, so I'm sure they can handle EMC. Well, uh, sorry, Dell. Yeah. Everything from the permitting team was thumbs up. We seem to be in good shape. Perfect. So, do you have any questions for us, or? So I'll make a motion to uh, approve the common victualler license for uh, ARA, ARA Mark uh, Dell for 42 South Street, 171 South Street, 176 South Street, and 228 South, South Street. Right. Okay. Is there a second? Second. Moved and seconded. All those in favor, please aye. say aye. 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 And opposed, Thank that you. is unanimous. Thank you, Samantha. Thank you for waiting. Thanks a lot. Okay. Here we go. Wait up on time. Dissolution of the Center School Reuse Advisory Team. I see Mr. Flannery and Vice Chair Mr. Weissmantel are there and some of the rest of the members of the crew. Uh, the Board of Selectmen will formally thank the Center School Reuse Advisory Team for its exceptional two years of community service investigating the future use of Center School and the board will consider dissolving the CSRAT having successfully completed its charge. Well, we got Darlene and we got John as well. Thank you for coming. So we guys have done an amazing job. Um, I don't know if people at home know how much work went into this, but, and there again, I'm speaking up first. Um, <laughs> <laughs> got no rank on you, um, but when the Board of Selectmen gave the charge to this committee, formed this committee to really take the pulse of the community and get a sense of not only the community's desires for the center school building, but also assess the town's space needs, they took this very seriously. Um, I was the board's liaison for that, and, and I can tell you, they met well over 20 times, um, had three public forums, um, over 400 surveys. 
I just did some quick calculations in my head just over maybe the 20 plus meetings at two hours a piece with nine people. You know, this board represented right there probably over 360 hours of people's volunteer time to do their task. And um, so, you know, I think we're starting slowly to move it to the next step, but I, I just, I hope everybody recognizes the amount of time and effort that's, that was put into this. They really took it seriously, and hopefully we will take it seriously as, as a good, solid starting point. Um, you have comments, gentlemen? And I will ask, turn it to the board I, as well. I think just from uh, my standpoint as the chair, I, I had a, a wonderful uh, team and uh, liaisons to work with made the job really easy. Um, the other thing that made it really easy to do was the um, the enthusiasm from the community um, to be able to give us input on what they think is the uh, appropriate future for the Santa School building. And uh, you know, I'm fourth or fifth generation of some of my family that's gone through that school, so I'm uh, proud to have uh, at least a, a little input into what the future of it's going to be. And uh, I just want to also thank the board and the town manager's office for all the support we got through them as far as just, you know, just the constant, um, you know, encouragement that we received from them and the, the help and anything we needed from Elaine and uh, Norman at the uh, town manager's office. And um, anybody else have anything? Other members? Quick question, if I could have. I think the last time we were all gathered together, at that time we were talking about whether or not we would dissolve the committee and we said that we'd leave it in place for a while. Are we all comfortable now dissolving the committee if that's what we do? I'm comfortable. I, I, I understand it's moved on to the next level and really to the next appropriate board to deal with this project. And I think that's uh, really the next step in the process, in, in my opinion. And I think uh, I won't speak for everybody else, but I think that was our opinion going into our recommendation and report to your, to your board on the uh, 25th of September last year. Okay. Thank you. Great job. Thank you very much. So, Rick, um, one of the things that you said tonight is something that you say quite often, that you, rather than take the credit, you push it off onto the, the team that you're with. Uh, you've done it with this. You did it with the police department. You've done it all the way back to one of your greatest youth football teams ever assembled when I may have been around eight years old. I have evidence <laughs> of that as well. So, <laughs> so uh, thank you. It, it's nice to have you in the mix. Uh, you've done a lot for the town of Hopkins through your life, and um, and thank you for chairing this this committee. You put a lot of uh, tireless tirelessly put a lot of hours into it. Uh, generally thanklessly, as as I'm finding out on these boards, a lot of it's thankless. Um, but thank you and your whole committee for uh, for putting the effort in and being doing such a thorough job. Welcome. I want to take this chance just to publicly uh, recognize the people who participated. We have Chairman Rick Flannery here. Ken Wiseman will served as vice chair. We have John Pavlov who put in a ton of time with the, with the mechanics of pulling together beautiful presentations for the town. Darlene Hayes and the other members who are not here right now were Laura Barry, Mike Allen, Amy Ritter Bush, and Frank Durso. And I served as the Board of Selectmen Liaison. And I just want, while well, Center School is the topic right now, bef before we move on, uh, part of the reason we put this team together is because of the community's love and concern for that school. And as I said, you took it seriously and put a lot of time into it. In that spirit, there continues to be concern. What are the next steps? Many people saw both today, last week, Mr. Terry coming forward with all sorts of concerns about Center School. We officially turned it over to the PBC Permanent Building Committee at the October 30th meeting. Um, when there is not information that the public receives, that's often the opportunity for people to start rumors or imagine the worst things. Uh, you know, people want to know what's going on, and um, I have been assured since those times that this process is moving forward. The objective was to get something up on town meeting, and Mr. Kamalo just walked out the door. I was going to ask him to give us 
give the public just a quick could, could, update. Could I, could, can, I, could, yes. could I say something nice about yes, the sir? group before oh, you do. change I the you subject? You didn't There's still two of us. Well, yeah, you, 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 did, you gotta they be went fast. that way, then you took over again. you got to be fast, yeah. and then I want to explain. All right, I don't want to through the chair. Hop to it. I just want to thank this group of, of real heavy lifters and great volunteers. You know, uh, uh, Ken, I'm, I'm just so happy to see you out here tonight. Yeah, and I, I know Peg's not, not feeling well, and, and really thank you for, for, for coming out uh, through, through all of that. Um, and it just shows the dedication of this uh, of the group and, and, and everything that you guys did. It's really totally appreciated. Um, now we've actually now we've got what to six eight people of good heavy nine. lifters nine people nine. nine heavy lifters. So this so you guys are free now. <laughs> so that's great because we have do have some other places that we can put them too. But uh, but no really thank you very much. It just it, it's funny seeing the dissolution of the of the team. It just uh, it, it just it's a good group. We should just put on a whole other task. But, uh, here's the chair. I just want to say thank you very much. Um, I was amazed when I saw the reports and I saw what you've, what you've actually gone through. Um, that, was, that was a lot of work. And um, it's a lot of time. It's a commitment to the town. And it's, it says a lot about your, your values towards the town and, when, and yes, that you really do care. Um, I think it's been obvious in everything that all of you have already done. But um, hey, one more, and uh, thank you very much. I really appreciate everything you've done. I apologize. Don't feel free to change the subject now. Everyone had their chance. <laughs> Mr. Kamala, right when you went out the door, I because the public is very interested in senior school, I thought this might be an opportunity very quickly to give a quick statement about where we are and where the permanent building committee is um, in moving the project along. That it is moving along because there has been public questions about that yes through the chair um, the permanent building committee has completed its review of the existing studies uh, relating to center school um, this includes the work that was done for the center school feasibility study uh, the library feasibility study uh, as well as the municipal facilities study that was undertaken by Johnson Roberts architects on behalf of the town manager's office. Uh, at its last meeting, I understand that the permanent building committee agreed to look at the following options uh, with a view at better understanding the costs associated with each option. Option number one looks at completely renovating the building however retaining the historical aspects or element of the building. Number two, retaining the front portion of the building, demolishing the center portion, and retaining the back portion of the building. Number three, looking at any other option that could be accomplished on site. Um, I also was on the phone on Friday uh, following a long conversation with Mr. Terry, uh, which I found very, very informative. I was on the phone with the chair of the Permanent Building Committee as well as uh, Dave Del Torrio, the town engineer, facilities coordinator. In planning for the next meeting of the Permanent Building Committee, we will be reaching out to Rick Flannery to have a sit down with you and at least gather some direct input from you in terms of what aspects from your study should really be explored at this next stage. So basically, I think this is where they are. Uh, part of this process uh, has included uh, putting a placeholder article uh, on the annual town meeting warrant to uh, at least look into um, requesting funding for whatever the next stage of this project is going to be. Madam uh, Chair. Mr. Herr. With this on the agenda tonight, I think it's appropriate, because it wasn't really appropriate when we had it brought to us before during public comment. Right. But this notion that some have suggested that we're gonna close town hall and move to the center school, I do not see that hop happening anytime soon in Hopkinton's future, if ever. I would be in the if ever camp. Like, this is town hall, we just spent all this money to fix it up. I don't see that happening. We might move a couple departments over there someday, who knows? Because we're gonna own that building and we can use it intelligently. But the notion that we're gonna close town hall and move to center school, I think is misguided significantly. 
and, and I would say that um, in the work of the committee, where Town Hall came up was as one of the many other municipal needs that there might be some space needs that could be moved over there. Yeah. That might that might work. But closing this to no. do that, I no. just don't see happening. Not the point, so. All right. <laughs> Let not your heart be troubled out here. <laughs> so thank you so much. We appreciate it. And uh, time go work goes on and I think the PVC is looking forward to being able to pull, you know, additional additional uh, knowledge that the committee has gained um, in helping them with the next step, but there are next steps, and let I want people to know that it is moving forward. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I will request a motion to formally dissolve uh, the Center School Reuse Advisory Team. So moved. Second. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Opposed. That is unanimous. Thank you. And um, it appears to me that since we have a budget discussion, which may take some time, but our, um, our colleagues from Lycan Biosciences are here. Mr. Kamalo, would it be all right to move Lycan up and, um, and let that get addressed first so they don't have to sit through all our budget hearings, or do you think we should keep the agenda as it is? No, I think, I think it's okay to move them up. It would be fair to you. <laughs> Why don't you folks come up? Yeah. Um, on our 8.30 agenda uh, is the Lycan Biosciences uh, LLC Tax Increment Finance TIF Agreement. The Board of Selectmen will consider approving the proposed Lycan Biosciences LLC proposed TIF Agreement. We discussed this at our meeting last Friday, and we have copies of the TIF Agreement, which I don't think has changed from what was distributed to us last Friday, correct? It's, there's been no material changes from what we looked at. No changes have been made to the agreement. So our job right now is to ask any further questions and vote a formal approval. Is that right? That is correct. Okay. And in fact, I also thought that um, since the Lycan representatives are present, the board may have questions that are directed at Lycan and they'll be here to answer them. Okay. Do board members have any questions they would like to ask that were not raised or answered on Friday? Is there anything else the town can do for you? I, I, I remember that um, when, when you were here, you were saying that uh, you're going to be a, a, a great um, neighbor and and when people need anything to come see you you're going to um, hire people from from the town and 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 take preference there is there anything else you know through the chamber or anything else that that you may need uh, beyond this beyond the the, the money aspect or the, the cultural side or anything else that we could um, help you out with the only thing I mentioned before John was a uh, permitting issues and I think we mentioned that uh, as we go through this build out, um, we'll be under a very tight timeline. Um, so anything that you can do to, if we need to help accelerate any permitting needs that we may need. It won't be anything that will involve safety or anything like that. General construction permitting, vendor permits. That would be very helpful. Well, that's easy. That's why we moved you <laughs> up on the agenda. <laughs> well, and in that case, let me read this appropriately so we get everything in. Um, I will request a motion to recommend that town meeting approve a proposed 10-year tax increment financing TIF agreement, which includes real estate tax and personal property tax exemptions pursuant to Mass General Law Chapter C, sec, uh, cha Chapter 40, Section 59, Mass General Law Chapter 59, and Mass General Law Chapter 23A, Sections 3E and 3F, and the applicable regulations thereunder between Lycan Bioscience LLC, Southfield Properties 1 LLC, and the town of Hopkinton for the property located at 97 South Street. So moved. Second. 
Moved and seconded. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 And opposed? That is unanimous. Thank you very much, and thank you for coming. And I thank hope you. everyone who is watching at home will um, come to the February 11th special town meeting. It's essential that we are able to get a quorum for this um, kind of above and beyond special meeting. Uh, and, and we do feel that this is an important, this is an important uh, step that will benefit the town greatly. So please thank come. You very much. Thank you very thank much. You thank very you. Much. Appreciate all your efforts. Thank, thank, you. Thank, you. thank you. Thank you very much for all your support. And to reach this milestone, I'd like to thank Norman Kamalo and his team for all their efforts and his leadership um, to really uh, reach this positive outcome. Great. So thank you very much. Thank you. Well, thank, thank you, Lynn. You. We hope we'll be able to have a nice partnership with the town. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you a couple weeks. Thanks. All right. Good night. Thank you. You don't want to stay for the budget? Isn't <laughs> 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 that a humane thing for me to do? Good suggestion, Brian. That was Brian. Okay. Uh, we'll go back to our uh, what was our 7.30 agenda item. We're still right on time. The FY20 Comprehensive Budget and Capital Request. The Town Manager will submit the FY20 Comprehensive Budget to the Board of Selectmen. The School Committee, Appropriations Committee, and the Capital Improvement Committee are invited for the discussion. Let's see what I have. Good morning. Good evening. Good evening. Until I work. <laughs> Where are the capital items, Mr. Kamal? Right at the end. I think it's page. Right at the end, page 21. Page 21. That's fine. Mr. Carl, can I just ask on the agenda? It kind of looks like these two items are sort of one and the same. Is the idea that this piece will be the submission and then at 8 o'clock we're supposed to have a discussion? Or I, I don't yeah, know. It's, it's, yeah, it, they're two related items, however, they are separate. Okay, so at yeah. this point we won't discuss, we'll just have them no, present. No we'll just present and then we'll move to discuss afterwards. Yeah. The, so Madam Chair, before you go in, yeah. the, the discussion is in relation to scheduling the next meetings where department heads will come in. Okay. <laughs> yes. All right. It's a scheduling item. Yes. Then. Okay. Thank you. Madam Chair, yes. just a point of order question about how we're going to do this now. So we're, we're in session. The school committee is here. The capital improvement committee is here. The appropriations committee is here. So are we having a roundtable kind of annual budget meeting or are we having a meeting and they're going to, how we, how are we going to do this? You know what I'm saying? If I may? Yes, please. Um, the school committee, appropriations committee, CIC, are invited to listen to the presentation. The idea here being, this is the formal kickoff of the budget review season. And it is advantageous and beneficial to the committee mm -hmm. that all these committees be present to hear the base information regarding the budget okay. going forward. So this is the formal kickoff of yes. our budget review season. Yes. It's not the formal kickoff of the school committee's budget review season, having sat through three of those meetings already last month, yeah. right? So Correct. it's coming to us now. I just want to make sure, understand how we're going to do this logistically. Okay. So if any of our colleagues have a question or a comment, how are we going to do that? Just ask them to raise their hand or? That's acceptable for them to participate <coughs> in the discussion with questions, is it, it not? Yeah, in, in fact, I did receive a, a, a similar question from the Appropriations Committee. If for any one of the boards a quorum is present, I'm encouraging them not to ask questions because that may then spare on a serial discussion that can only happen if those boards are posted. Is uh, everybody posted? Appropriations Committee is not posted. CIC is not posted. I did check with your jet. I bet you five bucks the school committee is posted. The, no, the school committee was not, not notified posted. until yesterday. Okay. So we, um, <laughs> we're expecting one more member to be okay. here shortly. Okay. But if you're not posted, so you can't get well, into it anywhere. Yeah. 
Exactly. All right, so I'm glad we're figuring this out. That, so that explains a lot. So this should yeah. strictly be a presentation yeah, lost five without bucks. <laughs> getting into discussing yeah. details with the individual committees. Were we, su Correct. Were we supposed to get into any of the details today? Because you know, yeah. is this going to put us behind, and how come we didn't tell these committees in time so that they could post so maybe we could get a, a, a little head start on it? What a way to kick off the budget season. There's a reason why we accelerated the schedule. The intention today is to hand the budget over to the selectmen. We have two months for this discussion to take place. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. Awesome. So with that information and now knowing that we didn't have quorums and, and postings and such, then it really is a presentation to us by the capital improvements and then us and the town manager and everybody else is hanging out and listening. Because if we go much beyond that, right. then we have a challenge with open meeting, which we don't want to obviously violate. And we can engage in questions with the chief financial officer, and okay. we can b have back and forth here, but not right. getting into these other boards, getting into the internals. Got it. Okay. I just want to make sure. Good. Okay. So we would like to welcome uh, Mr. Tim O'Leary, who is the town's new chief financial officer, and Mr. Dave Nalkajan, I hope I pronounced that's, that's it good. right, yeah. <laughs> who is our new uh, uh, chief town accountant. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Welcome, gentlemen. Thank you. And uh, Mr. Pomalo. And, and, in, and in fact, I would be amiss if I did not recognize Ben Sweeney. Yes. Where's the ben? procurement and grants office. He's hiding in the back. He, he hides back. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Chicken dog, you know. Oh. Uh, he'd bring him a chair. Yeah. And so. And so. Let me start off by sharing with you a few observations that I picked up from my conversations with different town departments. I will start off with a quote from the fire chief. In 2018, we received 2,505 requests for service, with 2,136 meeting our effective response force measures, and 369, underscore that, and 369 falling below our effective response force measures. Of the 369 responses rated as below the effective response force level, 218 were medical emergencies. And the remainder were fire-related and other categories. That's the quote from the fire chief. From the school superintendent, in FY19, Based on NASDAQ predictions, we anticipated the addition of 50 students. We had 189 students come to Hopkinton. And looking ahead, FY20, the school department budget is built on adding another 103 students. Also, I was reviewing the information from our most recent bond ratings, and it needs to be said that the town's assets are now estimated to be around $4 billion. So the budget and the services that are funded through the budget are intended to, us, to sustain assets that are worth over $4 billion. We also received um, our three-year actual evaluation of the other post-employment benefits. The town's OPEB liability now stands at <coughs> over $26 million. And finally, we also received the actual evaluation of the town's existing pension liability. The reallocated and funded actual accrued pension liability stands at over 
$22 million. I thought I should share with you these sentiments and conclude by a wonderful conversation uh, that I conducted recently at the Senior Center. Uh, I met one of our long-term town residents, and she came up to me and said, Mr. Town Manager, at the annual town meeting in 2018, you told us that the taxes were going to go up by $500. I'm here to tell you that my taxes went up by over $700, and I'm on fixed income. With that as our background, I am respectfully submitting the following budget to the Board of Selectmen. I'm recommending the budget at a total of $93,840,000. Including an operating budget of seventy nine million and twenty two nine hundred and twenty, including a two hundred and fifty thousand transfer to the general stabilization fund, a five hundred dollar transfer to the OPEP trust, debt service in the amount of approximately eight million dollars, and a proposed capital budget of five million six hundred and twenty eight seven hundred and ninety five. Of the total capital budget, approximately $4 million will be bonded and $1.5 million will be pay as you go. What is our revenue outlook? The total estimated revenue for FY2020 is $91,320,000, an, an increase of approximately $5.5 million or 6.4 percent from the FY 2019 revenues. The actual amount of certified free cash available for appropriation is 3,271,717. As in past years, the FY 20 budget proposes to use free cash as a supplemental source to support improving reserves, investing in capital assets, and OPEP, while avoiding commitments to recurring expenses. Revenue from property taxes is projected to be 72 million 817,321. Mm -hmm. State aid, based on the governor's budget and local receipts, are projected at 14 million 372,640, an increase of approximately 311,000 uh, from last year. New growth is going down. We're projecting it at 2 million, a decrease of 219,652 from last year. Local receipts are conservatively estimated at 4,721,262, which is in line with the last fiscal year collections and has a positive effect on the town's free cash. Other available funds are projected at 1,818,251 and include ambulance receipts, reimbursements of enterprise funds, indirect costs, and receipts from the Library Foundation. I should mention, in fact, one way of looking at these numbers is to basically pull out page, the following pages from the detailed budget <laughs> information. On page one, we have the sources and uses document. On page two, we lay out the same. However, we now include the enterprise funds. And then the famous chart is on page four, where we have the tax impact. Moving on, the projected budget proposes a transfer of 250000 to the town's general stabilization fund, an increase of 125000 from FY 2019. Um, in doing so, the town is continuing its commitment to creating and maintaining a general stabilization fund of 5% of the total annual budget in line with the DOR best practice recommendation. 
The balance in the general stabilization fund at the end of 19 is projected, FY19 is projected to be approximately 3.4 million or 4.2 percent of the FY 2019 total operating budget. We also have a capital stabilization fund. Uh, it's projected at the end of FY 2019 to be around $320,000. With respect to our enterprise revenues, sewer is projected at approximately $2.8 million, water $2.5, park and rec $514,000. The budget that is proposed for FY20 assumes that a general government subsidy for park and rec enterprise uh, estimated at 157,000 will be made available and also that the enterprise funds will fully reimburse the general fund for their related indirect costs with respect to employee benefits, shared staff, as well as general insurance. Water and sewer revenues are projected to be 2.5 million approximately and 2.8 million respectively, i.e. water 2.5, um, sewer 2.8. The budget also includes water pay as you go capital improvements of 115,000 and sewer bond financed capital improvements of 170,000. It is important that we point out to the board that the water and sewer enterprise budgets anticipate a water and sewer rate increase come July 1, 2019. The retained earnings of free cash for the enterprise funds are as follows. The water enterprise fund, 957,857. The sewer enterprise fund, 308,100. Park and Rec uh, Fund is at 142523 with an understanding that we have over $300,000 earmarked uh, in a separate account for the repairs at Foot Street. I think based on co comments that came up um, last year, I thought it was also important to address the community preservation funds. Uh, the Community Preservation Funds from the Community Preservation Act surcharge are projected at 1,230,000, of which 1,040,000 uh, is projected from local property tax bills and only 190,000 190, from state matching funds, which has been decreasing over the years. Um, the state match on the FY28 revenues was approximately 191,000. And the Community Preservation Fund's budget uh, includes the pay-as-you-go capital improvements of 710,000. My understanding is that if, this, if the current CPC proposal moves forward, uh, the projects that are moving forward will be paid for from cash that is already in hand. What are the reserves uh, in the CPC accounts? Community housing currently stands at 571,522. The historic resources at 628,528. The open space balance is 744,229. As you can see um, in the detailed handout from pages <coughs> Pages five through, through 18, we provide the detailed uh, departmental budgets uh, and for the most part all the budgets um, are, are indicating increases, although there are some budgets that have decreases. Uh, municipal operating costs are going up, public safety is going up, education is going up, public works is going up, human services is going up, uh, culture and recreation going up, employee benefits and insurance also are going up. Similarly, the sewer, water and park enterprises. Specifically, what are the changes that you'll see? And in fact, you'll see on, on page...
on pages 19 and 20 of the handout, we have detailed the specific budget increase drivers. Uh, they include, in summary, for the police department, the chief is proposing adding a sergeant. The fire department is asking for three new impact firefighter paramedic positions. DPW is seeking a water technician. Human Resources wants to expand benefits coordinator role in the office. The senior center is also requesting to increase the hours of the secretary. Uh, the school department is increasing staffing to address increased enrollment. Uh, blanket insurance, uh, the additional bu new buildings in town and vehicles are accounting for the increase. Uh, the Middlesex County retirement, as I mentioned earlier, is also going up. Um, similarly, given our actual uh, evaluation of the OPEB, uh, we are raising our investment in the coming year to 500,000. And also, uh, in terms of building up the town's reserves for the unforeseen and unbudgeted costs, the school committee has voted to establish a reserve fund that can be used in future years to address the unanticipated or unbudgeted costs relative to special education and out of district tuition. And in terms of, final, uh, of, of the um, capital budget, um, the recommended capital improvement program includes municipal, school, enterprise funds, and community preservation funds, totaling approximately 6.6 .6 million, of which 4.2 million will be bonded, and 2.4, as I said earlier, will be pay as you go. Uh, we continue the practice of balancing debt with pay as you go. Uh, which in fact protects the town from unforeseen costs and has been well received by the town's credit rating agencies. Uh, I have included the list of capital articles that were reviewed by the CIC and in some cases by CPC uh, and owing to limitations in funding capacity, uh, there are some capital projects that um, we need to continue to investigate possible funding sources, meaning that they are currently unfunded uh, in the town manager's budget. And as the budget uh, process uh, progresses, we also need to continue to monitor and report to the board on the following aspects of the proposed FY20 budget. Uh, as I said earlier, unfunded capital articles, budget sources, especially taking a very good look at the one-time funding sources as well as revolving funds. Um, the excess levy, as you can see, is going down substantially to approximately $400,000. Uh, snow and ice expenses, we're well, hoping, John Westerling, that you are not paying for snow. <laughs> um, we also are going to continue our ongoing conversations with the Board of Assessors regarding the overlay account. Uh, again, I think as they've reported in past years, until we go past the, the very big LNG case, um, they may not be inclined to release any funds from that account. Uh, we are continuing to monitor the FY19 local aid receipts and estimated local aid assessments. Um, with respect to the former, we are hoping that uh, the actual numbers on local aid will inform eventually our final estimates for FY20 local aid receipts. Uh, we also need to continue our conversations with all town boards and departments uh, relative to what reserve funds they may need uh, to address unanticipated and unbudgeted costs. We have already heard from the school committee that they are willing to look into doing so relative to SPED and out of district tuition. I was in a conversation this morning with uh, the chair of the, of the Park and Rec Commission and he also did point to that particular need, i.e. if Park and Rec can have the ability to tap into their reserve funds to pay for unforeseen expenses during the course of the year. As I said earlier, um, during last year's budget review process, there were specific questions that were raised relative to the tax impact. Uh, that point was actually driven home to me when I had the conversation that I referred to with the senior at the senior center. And thus, to help the community 
better understand the relationship between the proposed budget and the anticipated or projected tax impact, I asked our newest addition to our wonderful team at Town Hall, the CFO, Dave and Ben, to look into this topic. Uh, as we said last year, we were continuing to uh, refine the, method, the methods and the tools for looking at tax impact, and they are here tonight to walk the board through their initial observations. With your permission, I'll let you, um, our team, the CFO, walk you through what you found out. Okay. Thanks. Yes. Yeah. Uh, and I want to start off by uh, just congratulating and thanking Dave and Ben for the great job they did uh, taking over this budget process and bringing it home. They really did a great job developing it. And just coming in two weeks ago, uh, I came into a, a situation that was very well in hand. So it's really my task here to kind of explain a little bit about the impact of it rather than to take credit for all the great work they did. So as the town manager said, he's asked me to briefly review how the po proposed budget ties to a projected tax rate. And I want to just start out by reminding the public more than the board that the tax rate is actually set after the town meeting approves a budget and after the final valuation of the taxable property is known. The summary we're going to review tonight is really to give the board a good sense of where the budget is likely to land the tax rate at the end of the day. And I want to be clear that the numbers for FY 2020 that are on the sheet I'm about to hand you uh, look very precise because they were the result of computations, but they're really estimates. So I'm going to, uh, can you help me out? Sure. Pass it out. I'll give one to the, to the uh, put up on the board. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Dave. Okay. So, looking at this sheet, you can see a column for FY 2019, and there is a uh, column for FY 2020 <coughs> estimated. And really, the points I'm going to speak to are in the change column, where things changed from 19 to 20. And I apologize to everybody who's here and at home uh, that doesn't have the sheet. Next time, I'll be prepared with some kind of an overhead or slide presentation. I, I uh, had thought the technology was a little different. So speaking first to where it says on the sheet on the right-hand side, note one, the change in that top-line figure of about $6.4 million shows that the operating budget developed by the town manager calls for a change of 6.4 million in this, in this group. And note two, the next line shows some good news. It shows that 1.9 million of that required new funding level to support this budget is actually gonna come from uh, other than tax revenue. And that includes free cash, the library foundation contributions, increases in local aid, and increases in local receipts. So that knocks down the amount of the required tax revenue to make this budget work. And note sheet three shows that number to be 4.45 million to balance this budget, the net result of those two numbers. Uh, that's the amount in new taxes that are required in the coming fiscal year that are more than what was raised in FY19. And they're gonna come from three areas that are identified in <coughs> four, five, and six below. The, the note near number four shows an increase that's attributable to a tax rate change from $17.17 .17 to $17.25. That would generate the tax base we're bringing forward, uh, that, the amount of revenue shown there. That's an increase of less than a half of 1%, and it generates about 8% of the new tax requirement. So that's a good contribution. Because taxes are so sensitive, as the town manager said, I just want to give you a little sensitivity on that point. For the town, at current valuation levels, a one cent change in the tax rate equates to about $40,000 in revenue. So every penny the tax rate goes up or down slides the revenue about 40,000. And for a residence owner, with a typical residence of about $600,000, which is very close to our median residence value here, the $0.08 cent rise from 1725 
from 1717 to 1725 equates to about $48 a year. So the tax rate change doesn't have that great of an impact on the individual payer uh, with a $4 billion, approximately $4 billion pool. If you uh, go down to the next note, note five, that's where the larger impact shows up. It shows the impact on property owners from a general rise in valuations that occurred this year. And this year, the assessors are projecting the valuation rise will be just a hair over 3%. And that change, the rise in the overall value, will generate about 47% of the needed tax revenue to fund this budget. Together with the rate change, the average impact across the existing property base is about 3.5%. And it average is really not a good predictor for any individual property owner. Uh, the valuation process is very detailed. <laughs> and it produces noticeable difference based on market conditions. So while the average is 3.5%, you will probably not hear from the people who get 8 or 9% declines, but you will probably hear from the people who get 9 or 10% increases. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's just the nature of the distribution and the valuation process that we have. Note 6 is really the good news story. It says that new growth is expected to generate about $2 million in new tax revenue. And that's 45% of our new need. There are probably not a lot of communities in Massachusetts that are seeing 45% of their new tax need met by new growth. So that was a, a surprise for me and a, a very positive story for the community. Uh, note 7 just shows the projected value of the taxable property base for 2020. We're predicting about a $240 million rise in the overall value of the property base considering both the rise in existing property and the new value, and that's about a 6% growth overall. Uh, again, to emphasize the link between valuation and taxes, if the valuation ends up coming in higher finally, the tax rate will drop. If the valuation comes in a little lower, the tax rate will rise. It's really all geared to filling the need identified by the town meeting when they pass a budget at any given level. Really, the two takeaways I would offer from this review is that new growth is going to pay for 45% of the need identified in the budget that the town manager has submitted, and that the overall impact of property that was taxed in the past will be under 3.5%. However, it's not an even 3.5% for everyone. There will be people who are more impacted and people who are less impacted based on the very detailed assessment work that the town staff does. That's it. Uh, if I could, I could, would like to just emphasize um, one thing is um, we would like every, all of the constituents of the town, the, the ownerships, um, to note that it's really um, your tax rate or what you pay is based on uh, $1,000 of value Okay, that the 1,000, so if you have a $600,000 home, you would, you would divide that by 1,000, come up 600 times whatever the new tax rate is. So it's, it's really a factor of what your valuation is against the new tax rate. Okay, so I mean that's when we're talking about uh, full valuations that we're, we're saying that the tax rate is spread across all of everyone that's part of it including commercial industrial um, and all of the other categories residential that's our entire tax base that's where we get to um, how much we have to uh, set our tax rate at okay we spread it across personal property you know again commercial industrial residential um, so that's the determining factor how we get to that is based on how much we're saying we have to raise in taxes okay and then that goes into the formula but it's really when the people want to know what their bill is going to be it's whatever their value is against the tax the new tax rate and and you know the the tendency when people hear the three and a half percent as Tim had alluded to is that they're only expecting their taxes to go up three and a half percent and it's really part of whatever their value is against the new tax rate. 
And on that note, I'm sure Brian here is going to say, okay, let's go back to the basics and what is the tax impact? Excellent uh, segue. Exactly. Page four. I want to draw your attention to page four. Page four, the change in tax levy is going based on the budget proposed 6.51%. And if we use the old method, uh, and, and I'm looking at Mr. Manning here, is 6.51 minus the new growth, which is 3.11. So the overall tax impact net of new growth is 3.4%. In, in terms of, of next steps, I, I believe, Brian, based on the questions that the board raised at the beginning, uh, the next steps are based on the fact that the budget now is in the hands of the selectmen. The selectmen need to schedule meetings with different departments going forward. Uh, there may be questions that are asked. As we've done in the past, um, we will continue our regular meetings uh, with the Budget Advisory Committee, including the, the superintendent, the Chair of the School Committee, the Chair of the uh, Selectmen, the Chair of the Appropriations Committee, um, to discuss any issues that come up. Uh, and we're hoping that uh, we will continue our one town, one solution approach and present a forward looking budget to town meeting come May. Mr. Kerr, do you have questions for members? If I could, please. So, um Welcome, guys. This is my 12th budget it's sitting here. We may uh, have questions the, for you. Over the years. So um, I, I, I think I'm coming at it from different angles. I, I, I agree with what you're saying, but I think what you're saying is what we're going to do in uh, October, November, after we get through town meeting in May, and after we pass articles at town meeting that go above and beyond all this, uh, et cetera. So the, the valuation piece plays into that. But it all comes from what we spend sure. or what we appropriate, right? So that's what's still in play. That's and correct. While Mr. Kamal and you folks have done an excellent job putting this together, it's a great packet. Uh, we're far from that. I think there's going to be a lot of dialogue back and forth and some massaging of some of the numbers. But just a couple of sort of baseline questions so I can understand kind of where you guys are at and just my basic math stuff. 650k is one point give or take right so if we're taking a million and a half of excess levy that's 2.2 okay so if we do 2.5 plus 2.2 that's 4.7 so how do you come up with 3.5 in, in fact brian if you refer to page four it will walk you through the steps um, FY 2020, we're proposing to use 1.9 of the excess levy. That's 2.86% change. Right, okay. And the, sta so yes, and the, st exact, and the statutory 2.5 is 2.5. Right. And then the new growth, as we explained, 2 million accounts for 3.11. I'm not worried about the new growth. Yes. And then the debt exclusions that are already coming off, uh, up, yeah, coming off uh, minus 0.98. And then the unused tax levy that is remaining 436,976 is accounts for 0.68. That's how we get to 6.51. So for a taxpayer today, not new taxpayer tomorrow, taxpayer today it's 2.86 plus 2.5 is 5.36 minus 0.68, which is still 4.5 something. I don't understand how we're getting 3.5 as the number that we're kind of messaging, at least right now, of tax impact net of new growth. Yeah, you, you remember, Brian, part of the conversation last year was that uh, we assume that the debt exclusions have already been approved by the voters. That's why I did not include the 0.98 in that calculation. Right, but forget about the debt exclusions for a second. Let's just stay with, with unused levy, mm -hmm. two and a half, mm -hmm. and then what's left of the unused levy, okay? So if we're gonna, if we're gonna go take 2.86%, of unused levy, okay, that's a tax increase of 2.86% on the taxpayer today, mm -hmm. today's taxpayer, because it's money we can go take without asking for an override, right? Mm -hmm. And then we're going to take two and a half because that's statutory. Yep. That gives me 5.8, 5.36. Is that correct? Let's just keep mm -hmm. it roughly. Exactly. Yep. And then we back out of that, the 0.7 we leave 
because we're not taking all the excess levy. I'll I, I give you that. Mm -hmm. So now we're again. I'm back down to this 4.5 number, and I, I'm missing. I'm, I'm missing the disconnect between the 4.5 and the 3.5. The way you are explaining it is okay, one. Okay. Well, other if we way, take the debt exclusions out, that's yeah. another point. So there's yeah. your 3.5. Yeah. Okay. So I got that now. That's okay. Good. Thank you. But I'm struggling with this 2.86 of excess levy because we can, right? I mean, that's a tax increase above the two and a half because we can. And that's always been more of a reserve, especially in how our friends at the, at, you know, the bond agencies looked at it as well. I mean, that's a big, that's a big hit taking that out of excess levy. So there's a struggle there for me. I'm not saying we're going to resolve all this tonight. I'm just kind of pointing out some things that jump out at me. Um, and then, you know, on the cost side, um, in many respects, it is what it is from, from my scene. On the cost side, if, if there's ever been a five-year period where this town is absolutely boomed, it's, we're right in the middle of it. And you can see it in the school, and you can see it in the number of kids, and you can see it in the fire department and their calls, and the police department and their calls, and the DPW and the more cars and the more potholes. I mean, you can just see it everywhere. So I get the cost side, but I'm struggling with the revenue side to match that up, uh, at least with, at the first glance here tonight. Mm -hmm. It's just a lot, yeah. and a lot, and, and, it, and a big piece of that, and I know certain people can't speak because then they'd be having a serial conversation with their board members, but a big piece of that is the excess levy was created for reserves and not operating budgets year in and year out, but this is the second year we've gone in and just taken some money and really not had, a, I don't think, a very meaningful dialogue. Well, obviously we're going to, yeah. but we haven't had a big dialogue yet with the town about that. So, so one last comment, Madam Chair, if I could. So, again, I support the cost side. I sat through the school committee meetings. I looked. I watched them look at every pencil and every eraser, and every teacher and every position. And I understand where the chiefs are coming from with the with the personnel. I see the trucks looking around town as much as anybody else. So there's a lot going on in town. I support the, town the cost side. I'm struggling with how we're balancing this out, and. Um, in effect, what we're asking taxpayer Ted Stone, who's been here for 98 years, according to him, um, he's paying a 4 and 8.86% tax increase before the other stuff comes off. And the other stuff that comes off is going to come off either way, right? That was going to come off. The excess levy, the, 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 the debt exclusions were coming down because the high school's coming down and some other things are coming down. And the unused levy, well, we could have more of that. But that, that, those debt exclusions were coming off, whether he pays 4.86 or not. So he's still paying 4.86. And then some debt exclusions are coming down. And is that the right way to go about this? I don't know what the answer is, but it's a lot. In fact, Mr. Kamal. If I may, I, Mr. Hay, your, your point is well taken. Uh, I can tell you um, when. I was looking at these numbers initially, I, I saw the $6 million increase and what that translates to. And thus, that's why I think in, in my concluding remarks, I said one of the things that we have to absolutely review carefully and, and with full transparency is the whole issue regarding budget sources. Uh, we need to take a look at the one-time sources. We need to take a look at the revolving funds. Um, they, there is a substantial amount of income to this community that is earmarked into revolving funds. Perhaps this is the year we really take a good look at those revolving funds and see how we can use the revolving funds to offset the budget impact. We've already started doing that. Part of this budget is balanced by bringing in approximately 430000 from the uh, library foundation to pay for the library uh, debt service. We did that last year. We're going to do it again this year. Uh, we have also uh, earmarked a huge chunk 
a huge chunk of the free cash to pay for our capital investments. That in itself is lowering the, the tax impact. So to your point, Brian, I, I do share your concern, and I think we should spend a good amount of time going forward looking at the budget sources. Yeah, and I'm sorry, Madam Chair, if I could just make one more point. Mr. Yes. Kamala, I appreciate you reminding me. So as we look at how we came up with that number, um, you know, part of it was debt exclusions being a reduction in debt, exclu debt exclusions in this budget as we look at it tonight. Yep. We haven't gone to town meeting yet. We haven't gone to special town meeting yet. We haven't bought the new fire truck. We haven't bought the new DPW truck. And we haven't bought a few other things. So this negative right here, which is helping us tonight, is going to go up at town meeting. You guys haven't been to one of our town meetings? I mean, we can spend a lot of money really fast, mm -hmm. really fast. So we'll have to figure all this out, but I think you've done an excellent job presenting this tonight. I think the, all the departments, uh, the department heads and all their colleagues have done an excellent job getting us numbers that we can start to talk about intelligently. Um, but I think we've got a lot of work before us here in the next two months. Mm -hmm. Great. Mr. Gattino. Yeah, I, I appreciate all the hard work going into this. And um, you know, when I was hearing all the numbers, I was, I was uh, surprised because of um, all the all the increases that we expected all over the place, and and then when I'm hearing that uh, three and a half percent, I couldn't figure out how we did it, but you explained it to me, and it was something that I didn't realize that we changed the valuations, <clears throat> and that's something. And you know, I, I'm not saying we it's smoke and mirrors or something, but when we raise the values of somebody's house, they go up fifty thousand dollars. Well, that's fifty times seventeen point seventeen seventeen. So when I was looking at these numbers, I'm saying to myself. How did we get this 1717 to 1725 and still pull four million dollars out of it? Well, if you raise somebody's value of the house, and what I just want to make sure is when we were doing these valuations, that did the did the properties really go up between three and ten percent? I'm in real estate also, and and you know, and so we have to really be careful. Uh, you know, it's you know, it's already done, but you know, this is some of the stuff that it it, it looks like we didn't go up much, but. When the people do get the bills, to Mr. Kamalo's point, when somebody said, "Well, oh, I'm only, I'm only expecting 500, and it went up 700." Well, geez, it only went up a few cents. How did my bill go up so much? But this is something, you know, it 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 it, it added up, okay. But I would, and now I see the see the reason reason why. So I'm, I'm it so is what it is. But it's if, if I could comment on your statement. So um, when we were talking averages before. Um, so the average uh, uh, single-family home uh, went up in value, average now, we're averaging across the entire spectrum, went up over $28,000 in value from FY18 to FY19. So there in says the, the flux, you know, of example that we're trying to portray here, you know, if the average value goes up, that means some people are going to go down, some people are going to go up high, some people in the middle may fluctuate a little bit. But overall, the average, the average single family home went up $28,000 in value. So, you know, that's, like, that's the point where we're trying to make is that it's very difficult to predict where those are going to come in, how those are going to play out. And the, the, our sort of check to make sure that our values are correct is the public meeting that's done by the assessor, the, the Board of Assessors, and then the Department of Revenue reviews how we've gone out and done our work. So, you know, in those two circumstances, I think that that, you know, is sort of a, a, a check to make sure that we're not overvaluating and then after that, if the people still have an issue, they have a legal pathway. So, if I made through the chair, so what you're telling me is that the average home before taxes went up went up four hundred and seventy six dollars. Um, and uh, went up in, val in, in, in value went up twenty eight thousand in, in taxes. Okay, so yeah, so that's that hidden hidden number that that we're talking about. That's okay, correct. okay, that's. Yeah, to, 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 yeah, to Mr. Hurst's point, we, yeah, we, we, we are in the middle of a growth uh, period, but we really do have to look at all the other sources because this, this is going to be an impact on people. Um, you know, sure. it's, our town is worth $4 billion, but um, 
we, we, we have to make sure that we're, we have to watch out for the people on fixed incomes. My mother's watching me from up above right now. And, um, and so is B. McMullen. B. McMullen is not up above. No, but she's watching, she's watching on TV right, watching now. right now. And she's going to tell me on Sunday morning at church. So I, I think uh, just to add a little to what you said, my experience a couple decades ago in western Massachusetts was that they didn't revalue very often and people who lived in town for a long time had very low values and people who came in and bought had high values. And there was a lot of disparity between the taxes paid based on the value of the house. And I think the whole state's gone through a process now where they try to re revalue very robustly and very frequently, and then you use the tax rate to decide what the appropriate burden rate is, right? But the values are going to be what they are under the assessing standards <coughs> based on the, the approach that's prescribed by the state. And then your opportunity is to recommend to the town meeting a budget that will s result in a rate that, that gives an appropriate burden, supports growth of the town, but is sensitive to the increased costs for people on fixed incomes and others. Okay. I'm good, Madam Chair. Other members? Good. I'm good. Um, thank you for Thanks. pulling this together and some of the changes in the presentation that you've made, Tim, I think are, are very helpful. It's very helpful to us to understand where these numbers are coming from and how, and how to interpret them. Um, and, and, and particularly with the valuation, you know, people say, well, why don't my taxes ever go down? Well, because, you know, the value of your house has gone up. Uh, but, of course, not only people on fixed incomes, but just people who've been in their houses for a long time, and maybe their major asset is their house. And if you sell that house, then you realize a very nice capital gain from what you might have paid for it in 1960 or 1980 and what you pay for it now. But in the meantime, you know, that valuation, all it translates into is a big increase on your tax bill. You still got to fish into your pocket and that increased valuation you don't feel that at all you only feel it when you sell it so you know that that's always the problem that we can rationalize how we come to these numbers but at the end of the day you look at what it means to somebody when they have to pay the bill um, and you know along with mr. her I, I I've been following these budget things um, both of us have gone to all these school committee meetings and I realize just what this town is going through and you know the school committee on a per pupil cost and all we're getting a pretty good bang for the buck we really are um, but we do have a huge budget and a lot of and a lot of costs and uh, you know we know that things like excess levy it's not money that we have in the bank it's simply money that we have the ability to go and take whenever we want it without you know having to do an override it's it's taxing capacity that has not been used at other times when we could so so it's out there and and i'm always kind of i was telling mr kamala today a little bothered that we just sort of automatically figure in that 2.5 percent every year because we can we figure that into the calculations we're just saying to people boom we're going to raise your taxes at least 2.5 because we know we can and and you know I don't know what the answer is because we do have these these town needs but and and the schools are the lion's share but even when I looked at you know the numbers that came in across the board with the other town departments you know we've got increases of 7% 10% 6.6 7% 8% 11% 10% and those all may may constitute a very small piece compared to what the schools but um, you know, I, I just sort of philosophically hate the idea that every year we just say 2.5, bang, we'll just put that right on the, on, the, on the calculation sheet. That's what it is, because that's real money to people, um, and the valuation is real money to people. So I, I don't know what the answer is, but I, I would like people to feel that we as a town are making a real effort across the board to control the cost, because... You know, their valuation may have gone up, but if you've been in your house for 40 years, 
all you see is the is your tax bill. So I'm not asking a question. I'm just kind of making a statement. Madam Chair, if I if I can say the reason why we do have some excess levy capacity is because there were some previous boards. Mr. Kerr was on them. He was. Yep pretty tough on them that we didn't use all our, all our, that two, whole two and a half and that's why we do have some um, but the scary part is 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 if we use too much of it this year that uh, we won't have that well to go to next year and in previous or in uh, subsequent years so we, I, we 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 have to continue to try and have the restraint that uh, some of Mr. Hers boards had before and and um, really uh, look at, the, at every single line item and, and really see if there's something we can do or, or there are other revenue sources that we can attack uh, other than the uh, wallets of our constituents and you know this town and this board has historically really tried to respect uh, not wanting to overtax the taxpayers and you gentlemen both new to town but we have in recent years done two underrides which were basically recognizing you let that tax levy just build and build and build and it's a huge chunk of money that you could come and take from the taxpayers anytime you wanted and it was it was an assurance of pledge to the taxpayers that we're not going to do that if we need that much more money we're going to have we're going to come back to you and ask you for it mm -hmm. and i went to a municipal finance forum just last june and with all these different communities and people looked at me like i was crazy when I, the word they didn't even talk about underrides. They just talked about overrides, and I mentioned underrides, and people gave me this look like nobody ever does an underride. I said, well, "We've done two, which I feel is a real respect for the taxpayers, but that's that's unheard of in communities. But you know, that's that's where we are coming from. Isn't it true, Brian? I mean, people thought I was nuts to see we've done underrides. So. So, um, am I free to open this up for any questions or comments from other board members in the audience, or should I not go down that road where I don't want to get into greater discussion? I don't see a quorum of the school committee. So, if you have any comments, the school committee can or do question that. Or whatever. Appropriations committee, I see a quorum. Speak up, Mr. Sestari. Should we exit stage left? Uh, no. Oh, he's leaving. <laughs> 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 Love it. Yeah. Right. Hearing none. So I'm, I'm, I'm confused. Or, do, does anyone have any questions or comments? I don't at this time. I think the school committee is Okay. All right. So this board has asked the questions that they need for now. Um, our next step, then, Mr. Kamal, we will start scheduling hearings with the individual boards. What's what's our next step here for scheduling purposes? And I was yeah. on the board last year, but I wasn't paying attention because exactly. it wasn't my job. <laughs> the next step includes scheduling different town departments, boards to appear f before the selectmen. Okay. Uh, and if any questions come up from there, um, um, we will work through the budget advisory team uh, to resolve some of the issues and then report back to the board of selectmen. Okay. So we did try to kind of move this process up earlier, it created some time crunches, but hopefully it'll give us, last year we get into kind of a kind of a crunch at the end, so hopefully this will give us enough time to put all our meetings together. So do, shall I depend on the town manager's office to schedule these and get them on the agenda? Yes. Okay. So is it fair to say that the board recognizes the cost challenges in town for FY20, but is struggling with the revenue to cut pay for such costs. Like, I mean, that's kind of I, what I am. And me too. The sense is that that's where others are. So, yep. mm -hmm. I don't know what people do with that that are charged with working with this every day, but that's kind of where I think we are. Yep. Like, we get it, but this is still an awful lot of money on the taxpayer. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and you know, across the board, 
the economy is doing very well now, but I don't even know that people's wages have risen at the same level that some of these taxes have risen. I, I, I don't know, but it's, you know, every time it's, it's re reaching deeper into, the, into their pockets. And so I do think we, we owe it to the townspeople to make the very best effort to really give a hard, hard-eyed look with a sharp pencil at every single item that we've got here as to what we can. We have been kicking the can down the road on a lot of things, but. Tim, do you have a, you're looking like there's a. No, a I'm, I think that you're articulating exactly what the process should be. Yeah. You know, I think the town manager has proposed the budget and I think he expects a rigorous review and I expect to participate in a rigorous review and, it, and we benefit from that, that uh, public uh, valuation and come to the right decision to recommend to the town meeting. And it's, it's, we're at the very beginning of the process. Okay. All right, so is there anything more we need to do at this point or just move on and these will begin to be scheduled for our subsequent meetings? The board can move on. The board can so move moved. on. All right, so, so I guess we don't need to take a vote. It's just onwards and upwards. <laughs> Okay, thank, thank you, you very thank much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you to everybody who came Dan tonight. Dan and Dave. Sounds like a uh, duo. <laughs> <laughs> sounds like the same duo. Who? Dan, Dan, Dan and Dave. Who's Dan? 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 Uh, 2019 annual town meeting the Board of Selectmen will review its own annual town meeting articles and we have an updated list that's been provided seven. to us one seven, yes. yeah I don't see do you have examples of, any of these if these are our articles Yes, Mr. Kamala, do you, do you want to yes. explain anything on this, or is it just to the board to... Do we have any... any yes, I, I can walk the board through the list that we provided. Um, we have an updated list in front, in front of you. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Um, the first category relates to issues or items that have come up in the past 12 months that we've been discussing with Town Council's office. Number one, PEG Enterprise Fund. As you know, in our agreements with Comcast and Verizon, we have identified specific impacts to the local access cable channel. And under those agreements, uh, we have directed Verizon and Comcast to pay some, farm, some sum of money directly to the local access cable television station. Most recently, uh, DOR, the Department of Revenue Services, has come out and said they don't like that process. They would like the money uh, to come through the town and that a formal appropriation okay a town meeting. And so to that end, we are proposing that the board consider adding an article that will address that change as directed by uh, the Department of Revenue. And in fact, this issue has been in discussion uh, for some years, and uh, DOI has shifted the effective date. However, we believe now that uh, effective um, July 1, 2019, they may insist on this being the, the process or procedure for handling uh, PEC access funds that are channeled to local access cable television stations. And then the first street property lease, um, at the time the town approved articles 55 and 56 in 2017, uh, there were some questions that came up regarding uh, specific provisions of the agreement between the town and the entities concerned. Uh, and so therefore we're suggesting that um, we prepare some articles that will address some of the concerns that came up. Okay. And then the Osmad Overlay District Zoning Bylaw, I will let Elaine jump in on this one. 
Uh, there are perhaps a couple aspects to the overlay district that may require uh, addressing. One specifically relates to the limitations imposed on legacy farms relative to the number of affordable housing units. One way the town um, ensured that or guaranteed that uh, legacy farms complied with the maximum number of units was to specifically identify units uh, at the 55, no, at the senior housing uh, on East Main Street that would not have kitchens. That issue is coming up with kids. Fair view. Yeah, not kids. No, not kids. No, no, this is, kitchens. Yeah, fair this view. is one aspect. Oh, fair, 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 fair view. Fair view. Okay. And then that, that's the, the one aspect of the change that we're looking into. There's a second aspect, and I'll let Elaine explain that. So there are, there are three totals. Yes. Um, the first one being the Fairview Estates issue where the, um, the uh, on-site managers, there's two uh, apartments uh, which were constructed without kitchens because of the dwelling unit cap, and they would like uh, those units to be exempted from the unit cap so that um, they can have their live-in staff uh, live there. They're having a hard time attracting and retaining uh, good quality uh, people who are required to live there as, as their primary residents when they don't have kitchens. So they're asking for the town to consider that. The second issue, as Norman mentioned, was with the affordable housing and the over 55. So uh, our bylaw requires um, that no children be allowed to live in the over 55 units, and it also requires that 10 percent of the units be affordable. But uh, the State Department of Housing and Community Development will not approve affordable units which prohibit children uh, because it's discriminatory. So we either have to think about removing the affordable restriction or removing the restriction on an absolute restriction on the number of children. So those two possibilities are out there. Either way, if we don't do anything, the developer can't comply with the zoning. They just they can't comply. And the third issue is related to the, um, the parcel on East Main Street that the town owns um, next to the new solar farm um, that's for the recreation parcel, which was formerly the hockey rink uh, site. So that land is under a restricted land covenant and counts toward the 500 acres in Legacy Farms. But the issue is if the town goes ahead and, uh, as it may do, uh, have a uh, international marathon center there or some similar type use, um, that that land may no longer be able to qualify as restricted land and the developer will fall short, about 21 acres short, of the required 500 acres. So the other um, change that's being, that could be considered is to allow that to remain restricted land even if it gets used for that particular use in the future. So the use is already allowed, but what would happen it is it would trigger uh, or potentially trigger it to come out of the restricted land category, the developer wouldn't comply with the zoning because of something the town would do. So you're saying, but there's so a structure three. that we could change so that it could still be kind of as restricted? Right, so we would uh, add something to the definition of restricted land to allow that use to be part of that. Yeah. 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 Elaine, could I touch on the first thing that you said about um, the over 55 down on East Main Street? Um, not yeah. the over 55, the, the, yeah, the fair view. Retirement home, yeah. So they're looking for, it's there, they're looking to change the, the zoning or? So uh, when they were going through, so they, um, their units don't count toward the, the number of dwelling units because it's considered a commercial use. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but when they were, building and all they always had in their model two um, apartments for live-in help but they didn't realize we were going to count those as dwelling units so during construction uh, building inspector pointed out that there's these additional dwelling units and so to deal with it they removed the kitchens okay so they've operated for a couple of years without it it's been difficult and they're asking if the town can think about allowing them to have full units there so would that be a concession that the town is making to, because so I work somewhat in that industry, yeah. and the, these people, they have engineers that, uh, and planners that, that design these whole projects, and they understand what they're getting into. And uh, there's a lot of stuff that's gone on where people have come in, made, put their plans in, and said, this is what we want to do. And then the town welcomes it, and sometimes uh, you know, it goes to vote, and you lose by three votes, and then 
50 million people come into town and they change things around. I'm not for, um, if it's not beneficial for the town to do it, I'm not for at all making any concessions to these people. When I say these people, I don't just mean Fairview. I mean anybody that has come in with an engineered plan with people that are professionals that know what they're doing and then they change it and then it puts us in this predicament where we're going to need no schools and fire departments and, and police departments and all this stuff. I'm not at all in favor of any of this. So if it doesn't very positively affect the town uh, financially, I'm not willing to give even a little bit to anybody that's... Mr. Kamalo, you have a response. In, in fact, perhaps at this point what I can say through the chair is point well taken. Um, we are in direct negotiations with the entity and therefore your point is well taken and perhaps the board should move on. Mr. Coutinho yeah, had if, a, if, if I, a comment. They, uh, yeah. Brendan, um, when, they, when they came in, they thought that they could make a, a, a go of it and have the uh, managers live more or less like in a hotel room where they would have to go out and get their food all the time and everything else. But the way, the way I see it is that, um, you know, sometimes businesses come in and um, things change. And if, and if we can help a business be a stronger business and succeed in our town, I think it, it is up, 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 up upon us as, as in the Board of Southern to help businesses succeed. If they say, we, we screwed up um, and we could use some help, or, you know, and, and if, if this is granted, then, then we can have a stronger business, we can make more money, and then it, it helps the whole town. That's yeah, so, so from 30,000 feet, I don't see where, I guess, We'll table it. I don't see where yeah. us allowing their staff to have kitchens is going to strengthen their business to... to it was only two units is what, what, what yeah, we're doing. It doesn't matter. It's a concept oh. of it. It's Roy McDowell didn't lose any money on le legacy farms. But, but if, if I can just speak to that, I think they had like 100, 127 seems to stick in my head. I don't know if that's right or not. But if they had some kind of kitchen facilities, then those units were going to count as housing units for the town, and it was going to throw our affordable housing unit cost off. And we were just about at or approaching that 10% mm -hmm. and, and being in compliance with 40B. We didn't want to add a whole new batch of units to be added to our count. So part of the idea of not having any quote, kitchens, remove those housing units so it wasn't going to hurt the town if they weren't counted as full-blown housing units. So part of this was an agreement with the town not to throw in a bunch more housing units that now we have to and now they in want our to that. So, so, you know. So it sounds to me like it's like cooking the books and um, all these places do it and I'm not for it. I'm not going to, I don't want to get debate on it. Well, no, no. But my thought. Yes. I think if everybody was for, forthright and honest coming into all their, these developments that are going on, we wouldn't be in the predicament that we're in today. Moving forward. Okay, moving forward. Item number four, the kennel bylaw. Um, two years ago, the town updated the kennel bylaw. With two years under its belt, the town has identified additional steps that can be taken to strengthen the kennel bylaw. Um, some of these issues became very apparent uh, as we were reviewing the implementation procedures for the revised kennel bylaw during the last public hearing regarding Greyhound. And so we'll be coming back to the board again taking the small is beautiful approach, identify opportunities to strengthen the bylaw, and then hopefully get this to town meeting. Main Street Corridor Project Easement. Very interesting. Uh, as I've reported to the board, we're learning very quickly that the Main Street Corridor Project has some very interesting aspects that are unique to Hopkinton. And what we keep hearing now from MassDOT, uh, as well as the utility companies, is we've never done it this way. But again, as we always say, it starts here in Hopkinton. <laughs> so, 
we are now going back. <laughs> we are now going back and forth in our discussions regarding easements. Where Mastioti believes that the language that we used at the last annual town meeting regarding easements would suffice in moving this project forward. However, the individuals who deal with this issue at the federal level are saying perhaps there may be additional steps to take. So we are involved in this discussion with MassDOT, um, the reviewing the. The, the, the federal requirements, remember part of the grant that we are receiving from, 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 from the state uh, is coming from the federal level, as well as with town council to make sure that if there's anything we need to do with regard to easements beyond what we did at the, annual t at the last annual town meeting, that we do so at this coming annual town meeting. Okay. okay. Um, municipal parking, um, they are different uh, options that the town has been looking into that may require an article uh, relative to municipal parking along Main Street. And then item seven, this is uh, the plan B in the event that there's no quorum a special town meeting, what happens with the articles uh, regarding the TIF agreement. Uh, we agree that purely from an administrative perspective that there should be uh, a placeholder article um, uh, taking into account the fact that uh, the warrant closes on the 5th and the, uh, and the special town meeting is scheduled on the 11th. And then specifically, the uh, opportunities that we have identified based on the most recent changes in state law, um, tax exemption abatements, uh, there are four new categories that have been identified that we will discuss with uh, the assessing team uh, to see if they will be willing to uh, support adding these new uh, exemption clauses. And then short-term rentals, you may have seen this in the news, uh, based on uh, the, the law that was adopted at state level, we are looking to the opportunity of revising the general bylaw regulating, uh, to regulate short-term rentals. Um, and we have um, identified this as an opportunity that the board should, should, look, should look into. Excuse me, to the chair. Mr. Kamala, is this increasing the hotel tax again? It, <laughs> yeah, but, but, but the focus is on short-term rentals. The Airbnb. Airbnb, 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 exactly. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah in, in fact, part of that is accepting a statute that will allow for the collection of a community impact fee of up to 3% on certain short-term rental transfers. Um, and then the remainder of the list are the, the, the recurring articles. Um, financials, we have the last fiscal year supplemental appropriations, the last fiscal year budget transfers, the unpaid bills from previous fiscal years, um, and then the current year uh, includes the property tax exemption increases, the personal property tax bill threshold, setting the salary of the elected officials, current fiscal year operating budget, revolving fund limits, Chapter 90 highway funds, transfers to general stabilization fund, to the capital expense stabilization fund, and to the post-employment benefits liability trust fund. We have the regular pay-as-you-go capital expenses. Similarly, we have two articles relative to the community preservation funds. Uh, there may be some zoning bylaws that tie back to the Osmond, as we discussed earlier, where we may ask the board to at least uh, give its recommendations. And then any general bylaws as have been identified above, land acquisitions and dispositions, if any, and then the administrative staff. I think, again, as, as Brian here uh, alluded to during the budget discussions, because the warrant is still open for the annual town meeting, there may be additional requests relative to capital articles that may have an impact on the, mm -hmm. on the budget. Another week. Any questions on the part of the board members? Uh, Mr. Nasrallah? Uh, yes, briefly. Please. Please. On the short-term rental issue, is this is this really an issue that uh, has come up? Have there been any reasons why we 
want to address short-term rentals other than the, the passage of the, the state law? I think nothing specific to this committee, unless from a zoning perspective. The Zoning Advisory Committee looked at it a year or two ago mm -hmm. uh, in response to some concerns expressed by a resident um, regarding snow budding property. Mm -hmm. That's as far as that discussion went. Okay. So they, they considered going forward but decided not to. Okay. Okay. Good. All right, very good. Uh, then let's, uh, let's see. Now there is a motion here to request uh, um, request a motion to insert an to insert an article to the town meeting warrant. Can you say the articles as described? Is is that to insert a specific article, or you mean to insert these aforementioned articles? Yeah, I think the intent is to, is in relation to the aforementioned articles. Okay, with the understanding, as, as Mr. Herr mentioned, that between now and next week there could be some others, in which case we'll vote on those separately. Yes. Okay. All right, then I would request a motion to insert the aforementioned articles into the annual town meeting warrant. So moved. Second. Moved and seconded. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 And opposed? That is unanimous. Okay. Um, liaison reports, board invites. Board members have anything they'd like to share? Um, last, week, last week I went to the, uh, last week and I spent, um, that's the only English, they were also at the uh, Massachusetts Municipal Association's uh, annual meeting. And uh, there were some uh, great uh, breakout sessions. Uh, we went over risk-based uh, water and sewer rates. Uh, we had a guide to inform decision-making. Um, so, so we don't have sticker shock again, uh, as we did last year when we expected a decrease. And then we, uh, our accountants uh, came up and told us that we had to increase it. Um, there was a training session on, on how, to, uh, how to run a, um, an effective meeting and the difference between um, uh, keeping uh, keeping an agenda moving and keeping a meeting going. Um, was, that was kind of fun. yes, that was that was a lot of fun. That was a lot of fun. Um, well, actually, there was also another one on um, uh, the, the banning of plastic bags um, and uh, how other towns uh, have have implemented and, and how they got the best compliance. Uh, that was uh, that was that was quite interesting. You know, we we did ours through the. Uh, Are there rules? That by that, or do you just a different do different way, and uh, and also learned about a new algorithm that the the governor's plan for uh, school finance reform, um, and uh, how to get uh, more chapter seven seventy money. So I was going to talk to the uh, town manager about that, and there's then there are different ways of accounting and, and different items so that uh, we can get some uh, some more chapter seventy money out of the out of the state. So really, it was it was it was really a great weekend. Uh, Elaine went to s several other ones, several other. Um, uh, groups, but uh, it was uh, it was a lot of fun. It's, uh, yes, it's kind of nerdy and stuff as if you're a selectman, but uh, <laughs> it was it was cool. It really was great. Good. Thanks. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay. Uh, hearing nothing. Um, future board agenda items. Does anyone have anything they would like to bring up? We talk enough. We talk about parking enough for me. So. Sorry, Madam Chair. Back to the liaison. If I oh, could sure. Excuse quick. me. Sorry. Uh, we had a, a meeting of the Metro West Regional Transit Authority board uh, yesterday, I think it was. Mm -hmm. And um, amongst other things, and I can speak to it because I fully recuse myself with everything having to do with it. Uh, the MWRTA has installed a new uh, solar canopy uh, above the big parking lot over there in Framingham. And it's going to generate uh, over 50% of the electricity consumed. Uh, and I fully recuse myself from everything. Um, <laughs> but uh, it was a good investment by the authority and the state taxpayers. Excellent. Did me a short change, people, as everyone else had their opportunity. OK. Uh, in that case, I would entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. 
All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 And opposed, that is unanimous. And I would just mention, um, I'm timing. seeing upcoming board meeting is February 5th. That was not on our original calendar that we had for the whole year, but this is another meeting we put in. Yep. So the board will meet again on February 5th. Yes. Right. Good night, everyone. Thank Good you night. very much. Thank you very much.